a technical advance in access made it possible for patients to be dialyzed indefinitely uh, or more or less indefinitely using cannulas. And this was largely the result of work by this man together with this clinician, Wayne Quinton and Belding Scribner, who used materials which were simply not available previously to their work to create successful shunts which would, could uh, be used again and again and again. Those of us who lived through that period know very well that they were not permanent. They continually needed revision. They were a thorough nuisance. And it was only when uh, the needling techniques currently used came in that dialysis really became possible uh, in a reasonable fashion for prolonged periods. And this was, of course, first applied to adults. But Scribner was amongst the first to try it in younger patients. And one of his patients is shown on this slide. And her data down at the left and her photograph. The results for pediatricians and the idea of dialyzing children were disastrous. Um, this paper, which is a short paper in the journal, I think the Journal of Pediatrics, I don't know if it says there, no, uh, is quite short, but went round and everyone said, my God, you cannot get children to grow on dialysis. But there was a difference <laughs> later on when it was discovered that this apparent girl was not, in fact, uh, a norm normal genetically and was an exo genesis, as well as renal failure, and this largely explained her catastrophic growth failure. The first child, if you like, to be treated with, for renal failure was, in fact, the uh, famous case of uh, the Renard boy, who was transplanted in 1952 in Paris from his mother, Apparently at her suggestion, although this is not absolutely clear, and you see the participants, the mother, the donor, the son, the recipient, Jean Berger, who had worked since 1946 towards the goal of being able to transplant, and the surgeon who actually carried out the operation, Louis Michon. Although, in fact, he was using a technique pioneered by... Uh, uh, elsewhere in Paris the previous year. Marius fell off uh, a scaffold at work and he had an nephrectomy for the bleeding, as was reasonable, because his kidney would not stop bleeding and he was bleeding to death. But it turned out that he had a solitary kidney. His mother volunteered to give a kidney to her dying child no dialysis or immunosuppression was used, nor at that time at the Necker was available. The kidney functioned well for three weeks, but then underwent acute rejection and Marius died. A huge amount was learnt from this terrible experiment which ended in failure. And one can argue about the ethics of what was done, but it did improve, it made it put uh, clear that transplantation in humans was possible if what we would now call a rejection re reaction could be overcome. But the first, as you all know, the first transplant successfully performed was a little later by the Boston group, um, led by, actually led by um, John Merrill, who was a physician, but the surgeon, the principal surgeon, Joseph Murray, um, who later received the Nobel Prize for this achievement, much to the justifiable annoyance of our French colleagues who felt that um, this should not have been the case since there was at least one other person living in Paris, René Cus, who had contributed as much as he, if not more, to transplantation. Other twin transplants were done. 
and proved equally successful and showed again that if the rejection reaction could be overcome, transplantation could be achieved. I just showed this slide um, because for pediatricians, the interest of this lady on the slide, Edith Helm, who lived until 2011 with her kidney, <coughs> was that she was the first person who had a baby following transplantation, who, as far as I know, was normal and has remained normal. But one awkward fact was that a lot of these patients lost their kidneys, the main reason being recurrence of the original disease. Uh, and that was something that was lurking in the background to haunt some of the less fortunate twins. This slide may surprise some of you because I don't think Tom Startzel is usually credited who he st sadly died earlier this year um, with being the originator of systematic kidney transplantation in children. But in fact, he did 57 children, uh, transplanted 57 children in the University of Colorado between 1962 and 1969. Um, one of the earliest groups of children uh, to be transplanted. The, the donors, as you will notice, were a mixed group. And the reason he was able to do so many transplants is that most of these transplants were volunteer, so-called, living donor transplants from a nearby penitentiary with whom he had what is called in the paper an arrangement. <laughs> no details have been given or are given by Tom Startzel in his autobiography about exactly what this arrangement consists, but it seems that he was very relieved when it ceased. But he was the first person to describe the current technique used in most pediatric transplantations and to perform it, as I say, not in just a handful of children, but in 57 patients in the 1960s, well before most other people were considering transplantation. Those that did, as you can see, were nearly all in the United States, San Francisco, Minneapolis, only one unit actually, which is the Samaritans in London, did kidney transplantation in children at this time, although um, here in Scotland in 1962, um, uh, Woodruff did the first pediatric transplant in Britain in 1962. Oops. Successful dialysis in children and successful transplantation raised an enormous number of dilemmas which remain with us today, and this list is familiar to all of you. The problem was, at that point, we had no data on which to base any movements. We had to guess. Infections were a major problem in both dialysis, and especially in transplantation, once immunosuppression had begun, which was Startzel's great achievement quite empirically to combine steroids and azathioprine in dosages which did not kill the patient and achieve successful immunosuppression. And as all of you know, that was the standard immunosuppression for something like well, 30 years. Dietary intake, Cyril is going to talk about in a minute. Ethical problems arose immediately in 1959 the, the idea of transplanting donor twins aged nine in Boston raised enormous questions and public debate, uh, and it was eventually proceeded with. I've mentioned recurrent disease, metabolic bone disease on dialysis in children, which early appeared as a major problem. But it was growth and maturation, really, in all facets, from integration into a normal life, but uh, above all, statural growth, that worried us the most. The transition to adulthood was, and especially the services required, was not even discussed. I remember I wrote about, a paper about this in 1982, 
and I was able to write. It. This is there are no papers on the transition of children in dial in renal failure from childhood into adult clinics. The effect of the whole business of concentrating on one child in a family, enormous resources, and especially of trying to do home dialysis in this and home environment with other siblings present, for example, was very frightening to us and proved to us, we felt, in the 1970s, insuperable. And finally, what would the quality of the life of these patients be? I'd like you to read these three quotations from that time. One of them will shock you, I think. The use of the word dwarf by a pediatrician, I can only assume, was rhetoric to try and increase the impact. But Conrad Riley was a notable pediatrician in the United States at that time. Um, Reinhardt, these are, notice the journals, pediatrics, uh, um, pediatrics, and pediatrics. This is not somebody commenting from outside. This is what pediatricians worried about. And we worried about this in spades because we knew if we got it wrong, there would be, to say the least of it, a scandal. But we, for one reason or another, treated the children that presented to us as they came. Now, where was Europe in all this? I've been talking about America so far. And the answer is it wasn't. Where do you see the papers on chronic renal failure, dialysis, and transplantation in this extensive program from the 50th me first meeting of this society 50 years ago? And the answer is nothing was said about it at all. Europe was lagging behind at this point. And I think that point hasn't been made very clearly in any of the literature that I'm aware of. But suddenly there came a, an inter eruption of interest, particularly as the American relative successes came through. Uh, Starzl wrote up his patients in 1969, and this was at the time a very influential paper, as I've said. And units were prepared to take on the task of it, treating irreversible fail renal failure in children. And of course, children presented in renal, uh, chronic renal failure without asking, particularly with the hemolytic urinic syndrome, which of course proved a, a minefield, especially in terms of transplantation. One of the units that entered at this point was our own. And the first paper we published was on the early attempts we made to treat children by both dialysis and transplantation. And I think that was a very important place to begin. We were one of the few units who had a totally integrated unit, not only to begin with between um, transplantation and dialysis, the same physicians and surgeons involved, but also between pediatrics and adult physicians. This came about as an accident. I'm sa sad that uh, Richard White is not here. You've seen him with, with his microscope. He was not only an expert uh, pathologist, but he was for primarily an expert pediatrician. He was at Guy's, and he and I side, side by side developed the pediatric and uh, um, adult units. And then he went to Birmingham with the idea that he would come back, and he didn't. And so we, in the adult unit, for two years were involved very heavily with the pediatricians who had, as it happened, influenced the thoughts of the people in the renal unit, including myself, very heavily. And so there was very little difficulty in doing this. Anyway... There were very few data from Europe at this point, and we hung, clung to each other, both for dialysis information and for uh, transplant information. Um, it was, a, as I said, a very nervous and, I think, racking time. The first transplantation we did at Guy's was a father-to-daughter uh, 
which fortunately was a success. Um, more success than we expected. She had three children eventually. And when I last heard from her, she was alive and well still. But she has had two further grafts, both of them cadavers. Her father's graft only lasted a few years. But as I've again remarked here, crit local criticism in the United Kingdom, although it was never published with the directness that the Americans adopted, was considerable. And a lot of pediatricians thought that we should not be doing this. To begin with, we didn't go below 20 kilograms or five years. And it was quite a big step, almost as big a step as starting the unit all over again, going into children of two till five. But the Americans were already diving under the age of two and were still ahead of us, especially in the field of transplantation. Um, the data on the right just show the number of trip, uh, from, uh, from Carl Scherer's EGTA report from 1971. <coughs> you can see that there was enthusiasm for starting up transplant units at this time, despite this adverse environment. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Cyril Chanka. <laughs> we needed somebody to do what we were doing inadequately, which was backing up the general pediatricians with a fully organized and staffed nephrological service. And, um, Cyril was in the firing line for taking that over on a boat at, in Heidelberg on the Neckar at the 1970 ESPN meeting. His fate was sealed. He was off to America to learn about childhood renal failure from one of the great uh, people in this field, Mac Holliday, whom very sadly, again, we lost recently. Um, we thought Cyril was pretty good. We didn't know at that time, oops, <laughs> sorry. We didn't know at that time that he could also walk on water. <laughs> <laughs> Cyril. 